Hello. Hello and uh, welcome. My name is Carmen Guguta and uh, I'm uh, your host today from Technobis Crystallization Systems. Together with our presenters today, Dr. Vilmali Lopez Mejias and uh, Dr. Torsten Stelter, we are bringing to you the webinar on uh, accurate measurement and validation of uh, solubility data for polymorphic uh, compounds. First, I would like to share with you a bit of uh, um, uh, technical uh, information. Um, the webinar will be uh, recorded. It lasts around 40, 45 minutes, including a few questions. Uh, the recording, the video you will receive at the end uh, uh, of the webinar. Uh, on our website tomorrow will be also available the video together with the slides of this uh, uh, webinar. If you have questions after the webinar, please feel free to write us at uh, info at crystallizationsystems.com. Um, Also, in the chat function uh, during this webinar, you can send us your questions there and uh, our presenters will try to answer uh, some of them, uh, some of these questions at the end of the uh, webinar. For those that uh, do not know that well, Technobis Crystallization Systems, uh, I would like to add just a few words about us. We are a Dutch company located in the north of the Netherlands, a leader in three major markets, pharma, agro, and uh, fine chemicals, with more than 400 units installed uh, worldwide. Our portfolio addresses um, uh, crystallization, process optimization, and formulation-related uh, uh, research. Our uh, products, Crystal Breeder, Crystal 16, and uh, uh, Crystalline, uh, on my next slide, yes. Uh, they are parallel reactors that you can heat and cool in a control manner. You can work at different uh, scale, crystal breeder and microliter scale, crystal 16 at milliliter scale, and the crystalline at uh, uh, up to five milliliter scale. Uh, crystal breeder is your instrument to use if you would like to grow in a control manner uh, single crystals. Uh, uh, it brings you uh, quite a few uh, crystallization methods. Uh, they are available there. Um, all of them, all our instruments come with the transmissivity technology, which allows you to determine solubility, metastable zone width, uh, uh, phase diagrams you can construct with the, uh, with our um, uh, the data from our instruments. Um, uh, Crystal 16 is your instrument for any type of screening for polymorph, salt, co-crystallization. And the crystalline, which I said before, uh, works at a slightly larger scale, is uh, with the camera technology that works exactly like a microscope. It brings you as low as uh, uh, close to the nanoscale, uh, helps you uh, to optimize your crystallization process, develop your formulation process. Any type of information related to particle size, uh, shape, uh, can uh, be extracted from the experiments performed on the crystalline. If you have a Raman spectrometer, uh, the probe can be connected to the crystalline and you can follow while you are performing your experiments, the um, polymorphic transformations, uh, uh, chemical reactions, everything is possible. This was a bit about uh, us, and uh, hopefully now you know a bit more about Technobis crystallization systems. And now it come, I come to our uh, presenters today. Uh, to which I'm really thankful for bringing this uh, topic about solubility to you. Uh, Dr. Vilmali Lopez Mejias is an assistant professor of chemistry and the co-director of the Crystallization Design Institute at the University of uh, Puerto Rico. She uh, finished her PhD back in 2011 at the University of, uh, University of uh, Michigan Ann Arbor. Afterwards, uh, she pursued her postdoc at MIT in the Department of Chemical uh, Engineering. And since uh, 2013, at the University of Puerto Rico, her uh, research focuses on crystallization of pharmaceutical active ingredients with emphasis on the design of novel crystalline forms and polymer-based formulation strategies. Our second speaker today is Dr. Uh, Torsten Stelzer. He is an assistant professor of uh, pharmaceutical technology and the co-director 
together with Bill Mali of the Crystallization Design Institute at the University of uh, Puerto Rico since 2015. He received his PhD in chemical engineering from Martin Luther University in Germany back in 2009. Uh, stayed there as an assistant professor just before he joined MIT at the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, Dr. Stelzer is an expert in industrial crystallization and pharmaceutical uh, technology. Both our uh, speakers, they have an impressive CV. This is just a little bit that I uh, comprise in a few uh, minutes about them. Um, and now I'm uh, happy to, to give the floor to, um, to you, uh, Torsten and uh, Vilbani. Thank you, Carmen, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, I would like to say um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all of you who are uh, finding the time to call in uh, to this uh, webinar. And I would also like to maybe answer one of the most uh, pressing questions you might have. Where is Puerto Rico? Um, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory located in the Caribbean Sea and uh, just so uh, southeast of Florida. We are uh, famous not just for our beautiful beaches and our breathtaking landscapes, but also for historical sites and for our um, um, literature or sorry, uh, research the, in, at the Arecibo Observatory. You might know it from uh, a former James Bond movie. But beside the research we are doing at the Arecibo Observatory, um, we also uh, know, uh, known for our research at the University of uh, Puerto Rico. And here, the University of Puerto Rico system is composed of 11 campuses distributed uh, uh, across our beautiful island. Um, and we have two major campuses are located at the metropolitan area in San Juan, which is the Rio Petras campus, and the medical science campus just five minutes apart from each other and in between these uh, two campuses we have located uh, the home of our uh, research laboratory the molecular science uh, research center where the money and myself do research together with our students to answer uh, pressing questions related to materials design and crystallization process development along the entire value chain of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, besides pharmaceuticals, we also do research on uh, um, other organic uh, substances like um, uh, semi organic semiconductors and um, uh, uh, life science industry. If you're interested to know more about our research, feel free to visit our website, but also uh, feel free to contact us directly or uh, ask uh, Carmen for our contact information. So uh, in the past um, uh, roughly five years since we uh, started with the Crystallization Design Institute at the University of Puerto Rico, we have spent quite some time on the challenging task of measuring the solubility of polymorphic compounds. And uh, today we would like to share with you our, our experience uh, and provide you some insights how we believe we can ensure accurate measurement of solubility of such uh, uh, polymorphic compounds. However, before we can really dive into um, the, the science, we need to make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of terminology. So what is solubility? Solubility is um, the maximum amount of solute we can actually dissolve in a fixed a volume at a particular given temperature to obtain a saturated solution. If we repeat this type of experiment for over different temperatures, we can then illustrate this correlation in a phase equilibrium diagram, also known as concentration temperature diagram, or also known as a solubility diagram, where we have the concentration on the y-axis and the temperature on the x-axis. And we obtain a phase equilibrium, a so-called saturated solution. And for most compounds out there, the concentration or the solubility increases with increasing temperature. From this type of diagram, we can then also extract uh, information like uh, at what concentration range and temperature range we have undersaturated solution 
or at what concentration and temperature range we have supersaturated solution. And these are essential properties to actually develop crystallization processes. For instance, knowing the solubility curve of a particular system, uh, we can at any uh, given uh, starting point and end point, we can determine the maximum amount of crystalline material that could be theoretically extracted or that should be theoretically uh, uh, crystallized, which is the theoretical yield. On top of that, we can also uh, develop strategies how we can actually generate supersaturation, cooling, evaporation, anti solvent and so on. We can also derive strategies with respect to uh, multiple uh, crystallization steps uh, and how we can behave in terms of uh, solubility and concentration that can be achieved in all those single steps. This kind of knowledge applies uh, for batch crystallization, which till today is the most common um, uh, measuring technique, oh, sorry, uh, manufacturing technique in the pharmaceutical industry, but also in continuous crystallization, which is uh, since the past five to ten years really at the uh, at the growing interest in the pharmaceutical industry. This also applies for large-scale uh, crystallization process, typical for commodities, but also for uh, small-scale crystallization concepts or novel uh, crystallization concept. All these uh, different scales of uh, crystallization processes require at the beginning the fundamental understanding of solubility of a given system. So we then need to understand what kind of factors are actually influencing solubility. And here, one of them is uh, the choice of uh, the solvent. It is known that by uh, changing the solvent, uh, we can increase or decrease the solubility of the, uh, of the compound of interest. Experimental conditions have an impact on the solubility. As I have shown you already, the temperature uh, is uh, can be used to increase the solubility. Uh, equilibration time has an impact on the solubility and we will touch base a bit uh, later on in this webinar. The presence of impurities carried over, for instance, from upstream processes in the synthesis can manipulate the um, solubility. We can also do it on purpose by adding uh, additives in there. And then the solid state of the solute itself has an impact on the solubility. One example, for instance, is if we decrease significantly the particle size, typically into the nano range, we can then obtain a higher solubility. However, the focus, or sorry, although everything here is interested and we would love to share with you our expertise and discuss about this topic, uh, today, focus on this webinar is about the crystal packing of the solute or the lack thereof. And Vilmani will take you now in the next few slides through this uh, task. Thank you, Thorsten. In the realm of crystal packing, polymorphism is a phenomenon that allows molecules to pack in different arrangements and or conformations within a crystal lattice. Here as an example, there are two of the most stable polymorphs of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, tolfenamic acid. Within, within the packing mode of this polymorph, different conformations are present. The most planar conformation, the crystals display a yellow color, whereas in the more perpendicular conformation, the crystals are colorless. Aside from the color, there are many properties of the solid state that can be influenced by polymorphism. Solubility might be the most consequential property for many pharmaceutical compounds. The solubility ratio is thermodynamically defined through the, this free, uh, through the Gibbs free energy difference expression highlighted here. Here, the solubility ratio, solubility of form one over the solubility of form two will be close to one if the free energy differences are small as illustrated here in the case of indomethacin and methanamic acid. Whereas if the free energy differences are quite large, the solubility ratio will be much, much larger than one, as illustrated here in the case of the notorious vitonavir. So how do we determine the solubility of each polymorph to calculate the solubility ratio and thus determine the free energy differences? 
There are two general methods to determine the solubility. First, the isothermal method, in which the solubility of a saturated solution is measured at a predetermined temperature. And secondly, the polythermal method, in which a saturated solution is generated and the temperature is varied to determine the dissolution point, and thus its solubility. In the next slides, I will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods. In the case of the isothermal method, excess solute is employed to reach the saturation point at a particular temperature. The equilibration time to reach saturation is system dependent and long equilibration times are often recorded, greater than 24 hours. The excess solute or solution are analyzed offline by gravimetric HPLC or FTIR. The long equilibration time that characterize the isothermal method make this particularly prone to solvent-mediated transformations. On the other hand, the polythermal method highlighted here through the use of the crystal 16 also employs a saturated solution at the beginning of each cycle. The small volume of the reactor allows us to minimize the excess of the solute needed to generate saturation. At the beginning of the heating cycle, the solution is saturated and thus the turbidity measured by the system is low. As the temperature increases throughout the heating cycle, we are able to de uh, detect the clear point, which defines the temperature at which a particular concentration uh, we reach saturation. We can repeat this measurement using different starting concentrations to generate the solubility curve. The system also allows us to control the cooling profile to observe the nucleation. Repeating this measurement over several concentrations allows us to determine the metastable limit and thus define the metastable sum width for the system. These measurements are relatively fast. For example, a uh, uh, run at 0.3 degrees per minute from 5 to 60 degrees would typically last about six hours. Similarly to the isothermal method, the polythermal method is also prone to solvent-mediated phase transformations. There are several factors or aspects that we need to consider in me when measuring the solubility of polymorphic compounds. First, um, we would like to use uh, high-throughput automated systems to minimize measurement error, material consumption, and to allow us to access reproducibility. We would also recommend to consider or needed to validate the heating rate to ensure that the solubility is being measured at equilibrium conditions. We must also consider the thermodynamic relationships of the polymorphic pair. We must also identify the starting polymorph and confirm the phase purity prior to the measurement. It is also recommended to perform offline solid state characterization to confirm the phase and purity after the solubility measurements when using multiple heating cycles. And lastly, to perform in situ solid state characterization to monitor potential solvent mediated transformations using the solubility measurement. First, we recommend using the Crystal 16 enabled to enable high throughput and automation. This increases the accuracy because it minimizes sample manipulation that leads to sample loss during analysis in the isothermal method. This polythermal poly method enabled by the Crystal 16 offers in situ determination of the saturation term temperature using turbidity measurements. Also run running multiple cycles allows us to improve reproducibility of the solubility measurements. 
This makes the polythermal method enabled by the Crystal 16 a superior method to determine solubility data. The second aspect to consider if using the polythermal method is that the heating cycle or heating rate needs to be validated to ensure measure, the measurement is being made under quasi-solid liquid equilibrium conditions. Here, we have performed an extensive analysis of the effect of heating rate on the precision of the solubility determination for 5-fluoracil. We employed heating rates as low as 0.05 Kelvin per minute and as high as 4 Kelvin per minute and observed that below 0.5 Kelvin per minute, there is no significant difference in the solubility measured. Thus, we recommend to employ a heating cycle or pardon, heating rate below 0.5 Kelvin per minute. Regardless of the heating rate, it needs to be validated in a case-by-case -case basis. For fluthenamic acid, we determined that a heating rate between 0.05 and 3 Kelvin per minute, the solubility curve did not change drastically. Thus, we employed 0.3 Kelvin per minute heating rate as a, as a compromise or a good compromise between the experimental time and achieving equilibrium conditions. The next aspect to consider is that the polymorphic pairs present different thermodynamic relationships. If these are known, then we can use them to determine the solubility of different polymorphs. We can determine where the temperature range where these are table, stable and avoid temperature ranges where these can be transformed. If the, thermodynamically, if the thermodynamic relationships are not known, the solubility measurement might help to determine the thermodynamic relationships. In this webinar, we'll be examining three different systems. First, an enantiotropic system with a transition point around 42 degrees Celsius. Below the transition point, fluthanamic acid form 3 is stable and represents the most soluble form. Above the transition point, fluthanamic acid form 3 is metastable and its solubility increases with respect to that of fluthenamic acid form 1. The second system is a monotropically related system, tolfenamic acid, where tolfenamic acid form 1 is the thermodynamically stable form across the whole temperature range study. And in our final system, niflumic acid, we have no reports on other polymorphs, and thus we don't know the thermodynamic relationships that this form might have relative to potentially other forms. Regardless of the type of system that you're studying, it is extremely important that the solid state be characterized at various points during the solubility measurements. We can perform offline characterization by taking samples and analyzing via Raman or PXRD, or we can monitor in situ the solid state using crystalline alone or coupled to a Raman probe to identify any changes in the solid state during the solubility measurement. Before the solubility measurements, solid state needs to be characterized to clearly identify the polymorph and purity of the starting material. Here, we're showing the PXRD data, the experimental PXRD data, as well as the simulated diffractogram from the crystallographic information files for each of the systems employed. This might seem trivial, but in our experience, we have found numerous papers where the solubility of non-polymorphic compounds are presented without saying to which form or polymorph the solubility belongs to. Moreover, many papers do not provide any sort of solid state characterization before, during, or after the solubility measurement, making the solubility determination unambiguous for the forms available. If you're employing several heating cycles, you must perform solid state characterization after the solubility measurement. Here, as an example, we are showing the PXRD data 
of the resulting crystals after the solubility measurement of fluthenamic acid in one propanol. A heating rate of 0.3 Kelvin per minute at a heating rate of 0.3 Kelvin per minute. Starting with FFA form 3 leads to the recrystallization of FFA form 3, whereas starting with FFA form 1 leads to the recrystallization of FFA form 3 after the third cycle. While the solubility of FFA form 3 could be average over the three cycles, that of FFA form 1 needs to be carefully evaluated uh, after each of the cycles to determine if the measurement of the solubility is still possible. Dr. Stelzer will provide guidance on how we can monitor solid state changes within and between heating cycles. Okay, so one of the great features of the CRISPR-16 system is that it allows us to repeatedly analyze the same vials in multiple cycles in order to increase the reproducibility and uh, the number of data points collected. However, we would like to raise awareness uh, in, in this regards, applying this kind of approach uh, to say that just blindly averaging data generated during uh, those cycles might lead to adverse consequences with respect to accuracy and the reliability of the data points uh, reported for this uh, particular composition. Because uh, it might happen that uh, in the cooling process we are nucleating actually a different polymorphic form than we actually uh, were starting with and we have do not, we do not have a control over uh, the reported solubility. We also might an uh, endurance um, solvent mediated phase transformation and therefore we are always recommending and we cannot stress this enough that solid state characterization is crucial when we are reporting uh, solubility data. And here, for instance, the crystalline system enables us to monitor in situ uh, polymorphic uh, phase transformation, so-called solvent-mediated phase transformation, through its camera features. What we see here in this example is fluphenamic acid in uh, one propanol, and at a particular uh, temperature range, fluphenamic acid, here this uh, yellow light, uh, whitish uh, crystals, are actually um, uh, metastable under these uh, conditions and uh, with a higher solubility than uh, the stable form form 3, which leads to partial dissolution of uh, this form and to supersaturation of the uh, stable form form 3, uh, which are these yellow type uh, crystals, and leads then over time to a complete transformation from this compact type crystals to this needle. Uh, shaped uh, type crystals. And again, the beauty with fluphenomic acid, we can clearly distinguish it uh, based on color just looking at the vials at the end. So therefore, besides in situ monitoring features, we always recommend to use also solid state characterization techniques like powder X-ray diffraction or uh, Raman spectroscopy for offline measurement. However, uh, the crystalline system uh, can also uh, enable in situ um, solid state characterization by coupling it with Raman uh, spectroscopy and um, which actually helps us to maybe prevent uh, sampling uh, for, for offline characterization. And here in particular we would like to show you an example where we actually were able to monitor the dissolution or sorry the, the solubility of fluflamic acid particular form 3 in a region at around 60 degrees C, where this form 3 is actually metastable. And by monitoring this, uh, uh, this uh, experiment, the solubility experiment, we were from, by heating uh, our um, solution from 5 degrees C to 60 degrees C in repeating cycles, we were actually able to monitor that in all three cycles, we were able to obtain our, uh, maintain our needle, uh, needle-like shaped uh, crystals. And we can support this with uh, Raman spectroscopy where we can see here at, a, at the Raman shift around 615, we have a significant peak for form three. And throughout this heating and cooling cycles, 
we maintain, we nucleate and maintain then in the solubility measurements our peak for uh, form three. So we can really ensure here through this in situ uh, uh, measurement that we are able to accurately measure actually the metastable form. And this is possible because the polythermal method uh, with the relatively uh, fast heating rate with respect to the phase transformation kinetic, we are, can actually outrun this uh, transformation of the metastable form to the more uh, stable form, in this case, fluofenamic acid form one. However, on the opposite, we can also demonstrate that in case of measuring the solubility of form one, uh, that uh, the transformation kinetic below the transition point of 42 degrees C is actually faster than the heating rate we can apply for this uh, particular system. Any attempts to increase the heating rate would lead to inaccuracy in terms of reporting uh, quasi-equilibrium uh, solubility data. And we can support this finding with uh, studying then the solubility also at high temperature, where we expect that form one is the stable form um, over multiple cycles. And we heat here from 45 degrees C to 60 degrees C. And what we interestingly observed was that in the first cycle we can, and we can prove this with our Raman uh, signal, that we were able to uh, dissolve and uh, the sol or to determine the solubility of form one. However, by re repeating cycles, we were then able to obtain um, all of a sudden form, form three. And therefore, we have to conclude here that we can only average or we can only use the solubility data uh, used for cycle one. Cycle two and three leads to uh, deviations from the solubility data reported form one. Uh, a similar uh, aspect can also then be reported for a monotropic system, torphanamic acid, where the difference between form one and form two has uh, uh, the energy minimum or uh, the energy difference is very small. So the, the, we can conclude that the solubility are relatively close to each other. And we, uh, we can visually clearly distinguish between form one and form two here by this white and yellow type uh, uh, crystals. So any attempt uh, to measure actually the solubility of uh, form two uh, resulted in solvent mediated phase transformation towards uh, form one and we are not able to determine the solubility. However, what was also interesting then was that we could also really uh, measure only at uh, cycle one the solubility of uh, form one and even if in repeating cycles, the data mined uh, solubility uh, temperature is relatively uh, similar and it might be interpreted as a uh, stochastic uh, error or stochastic variance in the experiments. It's actually related to a different nucleation of different uh, two different uh, torphanamic acid polymorphs, form one and form two. And we can support this with offline characterization using uh, powder X-ray diffraction and can use then this information to select only those data points where we can ensure that we have really measured uh, the solubility of pure torphanamic acid form one to increase the accuracy of the reported solubility in this case for these four different solvents. In a system where we don't know any uh, polymorphic uh, relationship, uh, in this case, nifluming acid, we can then actually also um, use this kind of multiple uh, uh, heating and cooling cycles. And we can also then play with different uh, uh, heating and cooling rates uh, to actually see if we can obtain different, uh, a different polymorphic form than uh, the starting material. And in the case of nifluming acid, we can conclude that the repeating experiments, the re repeating cycles lead consistently, and this was supported with in situ Raman and uh, offline PXRD, uh, consistently to the starting material. So thus, we can conclude that under these conditions studied in this temperature range with this solvents, 
that this solid form of nefluminic acid is most likely the most thermodynamically stable uh, polymorph. Those, uh, by now, um, I was hopefully, or we were hopefully able to convince to you that uh, in order to measure accurately the solubility of a polymorphic compound, which is not an, an easy task, we definitely recommend to employ a polythermal method over an isothermal method, simply because we have the feature that we might be able to outrun the phase transformation kinetic um, compared to the heating rate we are employing. And um, however, in order to employ, uh, employ uh, um, heating rate, we need to ensure first that the heating rate chosen is validated in order to ensure that we have quasi solid liquid equilibrium conditions. And Vimani has shown you uh, the very nice examples how we can do that. Then we can uh, use this type of uh, measurements with heating and cooling cycles to actually data mine a uh, thermodynamic relationship of a system we might don't know, but also to confirm the thermodynamic relationship of a, a stable and the metastable form. And then we, uh, we cannot stress this uh, then enough, we need to ensure that we employ solid state characterization in parallel to the solubility measurements. Again, you would be surprised when looking into the literature how many publications are actually reported without providing information of the really uh, polymorphic form of the starting material and actually of the material the solubility was measured or even recovered in multiple cycles. So um, with this we would like to say then a thank you to all of our uh, sponsors who have uh, supported our research, to our uh, students in the Crystallization Design Institute, and in particular Luz, Victor and Alondra, who have uh, worked hard to uh, develop those data we have presented to you today. And of course, we would like to thank uh, uh, Technobis Crystallization Systems, in particular Carmen and uh, Amy Wagner, uh, for their uh, support over the, uh, the past five years and for the opportunity to present to you our research in this webinar. And we are happy to answer any possible question. Thank you very much, Thorsten and uh, Vilmali, for this uh, uh, webinar. Um, we have received a few questions now that I will uh, try to read to you. Uh, one of our um, attendees uh, um, is asking, "What would you uh, suggest um, in or what you would you suggest to uh, to do in order to monitor uh, these polymorphic transformations?" um related more related to metastable forms how to catch them what would you do what are a few rules that you would uh, um, name out to um, to monitor this and to catch those that you cannot uh, easily uh, see so the, the first thing is that the starting polymorph that you are going to put into the to generate the saturated solution needs to be of high purity if you have seeds of the thermodynamically stable form from the gecko, you're gonna uh, facilitate the solvent mediated transformation uh, more so than, than if not. So purity of the initial polymorph is, is of the utmost importance and that should be characterized and quantified. The next thing that you need to do is to uh, validate the heating rate. If you can use the faster the heating rate you can use without compromising the reliability of the solubility data, right? Without varying it. Um, let's see. I don't know. Without compromising the the relative deviation of this determining solubility data, the better you're gonna be off. So like the the faster you can, if you can go faster than 0.3 Kelvin per minute without changing significantly your solubility curve, that would be a great thing to do because then you can outrun the solvent-mediated 
uh, phase transformations during the first cycle, which is all you need to construct your solubility data. And there might be cases where the free energy differences don't allow you to solve the solubility data to determine it. So that might also be you know, an impossible task, but if it can be done, then it should be done in this way. Okay. Um, another attendee is um, uh, mentioning uh, has no experience with Raman, but experience with IR, and uh, knows that for IR you need to do a calibration uh, curve. Uh, um, how is with Raman? Uh, is that needed? And how is uh, the crystalline? How can you do that if you need to do it with uh, the crystalline? I mean, definitely you can do quantitative analysis using RAM, both IR and Raman. Uh, I don't think that you need a calibration curve or to do quantitative analysis. I think um, determining that if there's uh, the presence of another form or not within the detection limit of that instrument, be it the Raman or the IR, is enough to support that there has been solid form transformation or there has not been another question do you have recommendations for measuring solubility curve of mixed components salt and api in solution for example is crystal 16 able to aid that or any other way to do it um of a salt crystal or a salt ana crystal i'm not sure yeah, salts and API in solution. Maybe um, they uh, mean both uh, neutral form and the salt form? I mean, uh, it should be the same solubility, like... Um, mixed, the, the attendee says now mixed API and uh, uh, the salt form. So most probably... Okay, um, the question is, the question is, do, is it meant here that we study a neutral uh, uh, molecule and uh, a mix, the a salt? Mixture, a mixture yeah, like, of... Uh, most probably they make the salt from the neutral form and you have a mixed salt form. I mean, do we have experience with it? No. To answer this question yeah. in this way, it was, it was asked. Do we have experience measuring a salt form of a molecule? Um, yes, I mean, this works in a, in a similar way, right? Um, I don't know if this answers the question. Um, you, you, as a reference, you can use um, our paper on this uh, solubility determination for warfarin sodium, uh, which is a salt crystal. And it's actually a, a solvated salt crystal. Um, so that might give you some some impact, some aspects, right, of the things to consider. Uh, but I think I, I think uh, we cannot answer specifically the question of the, I, yeah. the salt. I will share later on because I have a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, several questions I have to say. I will share them later on and maybe you will be in contact with uh, this person. And the name is Iman Tabar, so you would be able to um, um, uh, further um, answer on this topic. Uh, I will take one more question um, from Eliandro Nicolas Aibar. Uh, hi, I'm from uh, uh, Sinton, Argentina and we are working on a process in uh, with, with the solid in which the solid is crystallized from a mixture methanol dmf and some salts of uh, uh, zinc chloride and the api uh, solid product we are intended to obtain on pure form the question is uh, is is it the, the right way of measuring the solubility of the pure form or it's better to perform the measurement on a mix, I think, what they are saying? I mean, you can I, determine the solubility in pure, in pure solvents or in binary or ternary mixtures. Uh, we have two papers here um, that are highlighted below. Uh, in the first paper, we determined the solubility of 5-fluoracil in mixtures of water and, I think, ethanol. And here are the solubility curves at different fractions of water and ethanol, uh, being water the antisolvent and ethanol the co-solvent. 
and in the third paper that we have uh, with warfarin sodium, we have binary and ternary solvent mixtures, which is close to what he is describing. Okay, so, what exactly are D on Y axis mean? I do not know where uh, on which slide was this. If you guys remember, you have an RD on a Y axis. Ah, okay. Um, so what is that's on validation? So here, um, the RD on this axis, uh, it's the relative deviation of of the standard deviation for the measurement of the solubility. So we took the uh, 0 0.05 uh, Kelvin per minute heating rate as the, let's say, null value. And then we determined the relative deviation of all other heating rates relative to that very slow heating rate. And if you want to know more about this or want to understand it more, read here, you see the reference down there, the first reference uh, from our student, uh, Rocio Sorilla. Um, she has uh, done this research and we, I think it's well described within this paper. But we are happy to answer any question uh, beyond that uh, if it's uh, via email. I uh, take only one last question, although I have more, I will copy all of them and uh, uh, share with, uh, um, with you too. Um, is there a good way to measure some chemicals which solubility is very low? So I guess the question is, if you would have low soluble compounds, what would you recommend to do? Okay, so I mean, if we have a very low solubility, well, uh, this what is low is the first, first question. So we usually have, uh, we recommend not measuring a solubility below point, uh, sorry, below one uh, milligram per milliliter. And then this also depends what is the crystal size. Uh, imagine in the way the in the way the crystal 16 is measuring, right? You have uh, crystals um, dispersed or suspended in uh, our uh, uh, solvent, and then the light is passing through the suspension, and every particle is obstructing uh, the light going through. So we are measuring the transmissivity, and then you can imagine. If we have uh, one large crystal, uh, the probability that this one large crystal is obstructing the, the path of light is relatively low. However, if we have relatively uh, small crystals, the number of crystals that can obstruct the light is, uh, um, is higher. So as a, I cannot say a general rule of thumb, but of course you are limited if you really go, um, in our experience, below one milligram per milliliter. Okay, um, I think um, here we are going to stop. I will. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, another one coming now. Uh, please, um, uh, but we need to 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 stop. Um, please feel free to uh, write your questions at info at crystallizationsystems.com. We will make sure uh, that uh, both Thorsten and Vilma Lee will um, uh, receive your um, uh, your questions and will be answered uh, this week and coming week. Uh, the slides of the uh, presentation will be soon available. Also the recording, uh, just have a bit of patience, a few hours uh, with me and I will make everything uh, uh, available. Once again, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Vilma Lee and Thorsten for making this available to us and sharing uh, some of your thoughts with uh, our um, uh, viewers. And uh, I wish you all a good day or evening. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming to see us or hearing us. Yes, thank <laughs> we you. We will be happy. <laughs> thank you very much.